The following is distributed by the Berean Call. Chapter 3, A Colossal Trap? The gathering momentum of the grassroots movement for peace is a hopeful sign. The horror of the nuclear sword of Damocles hanging over all our heads has finally aroused a ground swell of anti-nuclear crusading. As actor Paul Newman, a member of the U.S. delegation to the first U.N. disarmament conference in 1978, declared at an October 5, 1982, pro-nuclear freeze press conference in Los Angeles, quote, there is no other issue that transcends this one, unquote. Rising to the desperation of the hour, millions of concerned citizens, celebrities, scientists, and respected leaders are forming action networks to bring massive pressure upon the major powers for nuclear disarmament. Their ranks include Thomas Watson, former chairman of IBM, William Colby, former director of the CIA, Clark Clifford, former secretary of defense, and many others of like stature. They constitute a new force that may well prove powerful enough to bring about a complete worldwide change in policies and direction. At a New York press conference in February 1982, Dean of Science Fiction writers Isaac Asimov summed up the quiet anger and determination felt by growing numbers of activists when he declared, quote, If there is one thing we know for certain, it is that if we do nothing, nothing at all, then disaster is certain to overtake us. We must do something." Unquote. The Planetary Initiative The something Isaac Asimov referred to is called the Planetary Initiative for the World We Choose. Asimov was chairman of the committee which set up that press conference on February 8, 1982, in order to introduce this remarkable group to the world. Planetary Initiative is not only working for nuclear disarmament, but for a new world order of New Age Socialism. The ultimate goal is a one-world government based upon the premise that the only hope for survival of the human race is to create a new consciousness that transcends, quote, narrow national loyalties, unquote, and embodies a new sense of, quote-unquote, global citizenship. The Planetary Initiative widely distributes an elaborate organizing manual containing very sophisticated and detailed directions for setting up, quote, local coordinating councils, unquote, in a vast international network leading to a World Congress in 1983. Having its roots in the United Nations, the Planetary Initiative for the World We Choose was conceived in January 1981, when the, quote, heads of five organizations joined together to co-sponsor a major gathering of leaders from a broad spectrum of groups, unquote, to work for a new and unified world order. Quote, the co-sponsors were from the Association for Humanistic Psychology, Club of Rome, Global Education Associates, Planetary Citizens, that is a UN-related organization, see below, and the United Nations Association of New South Wales. Seventy-five international leaders met at the Stony Point Conference Center in New York, from mainstream church, political, and social action groups, from human potential and new consciousness, that is, New Age organizations, from global-oriented academic research institutes, unquote. Goals of the Planetary Initiative include the following, quote, to assist in development of a network for global cooperation among the numerous organizations and individuals addressing planetary problems, a communication system equal to capturing this data and relaying this information to network members and to the press will be developed. In preparing for the culminating Congress in 1983, involving the public in a constructive process illustrative of our capacity to choose and shape the human future. The Planetary Initiative Project will develop an enduring network of individuals, local groups, and global organizations for contributing to the creation of a peaceful, just, and humane world order." Unquote. The Planetary Initiative is an outgrowth of Planetary Citizens, 
quote, which is in consultative status with the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations, unquote. Planetary citizens, in turn, grew out of the 1970 Conference on Human Survival, held at the United Nations in New York and hosted by then-Secretary General U. Taunt. One of the guiding personalities behind that 1970 conference was Norman Cousins, who, quote, serves as honorary chairman of the Planetary Citizens, unquote. The Planetary Initiative is an important part of the huge international New Age movement involving networks of thousands of organizations and millions of sincere people, all working for a new world of peace, harmony, and brotherly love. Since Marilyn Ferguson first documented the vast scope and power of this movement in her bestseller, The Aquarian Conspiracy, the quote-unquote conspiracy has grown far larger. It may well hold the key to the future of planet Earth. We will have much more to say about this later. A Trap? Petitions demanding a nuclear freeze are circulating in over 100 non-communist countries, but none in any communist nation. Under that system, such petitions are considered provocation worthy of prison. Consider the following examples taken from a 60-day period in the spring of 1982. Late in April, quote, seven European peace demonstrators unfurled a banner in Red Square calling for peace, bread, and disarmament. Within two minutes, they were bundled up by the KGB and whisked away, unquote. On May 3rd, the Bishop of Communist East Berlin, quote, was moved to ask young East Berliners wearing disarmament bands to remove them, unquote. On June 3rd in Leningrad, quote, a small group of peace demonstrators, including U.S. peacenik Daniel Ellsberg of Pentagon Papers fame, were summarily, quote, towed out to sea, unquote. Ten days later, quote, police sealed off a Moscow apartment where a fledgling disarmament group of ten people were planning to meet. The group was dispersed as being, quote, provocative, antisocial, and illegal, unquote. The hapless leader of the group, Batavran, was duly informed that, quote, the Soviet government and people are fighting for peace, unquote. To date, his whereabouts are unknown, unquote. On the other hand, the Soviets are very much in favor of peace demonstrations in the U.S. and Western Europe. Is this simple self-righteousness, or does it represent something more sinister? Communist front organizations have been involved in the nuclear freeze movement, including organizing demonstrations. TASS described the huge June 12 demonstration of nearly a million people in New York City's Central Park as a popular expression of, quote, resolute disagreement with the U.S. government's policy of war preparations, unquote. The implication was, of course, that the Soviets are not at all involved in, quote-unquote, war preparations. Popular demand by the man in the street for positive change was tied in Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and elsewhere. The tragic, oppressive, brutal results are known to the whole world. The sincere men and women involved in the thousands of grassroots organizations, large and small, forming New Age networks working for peace around the world are to be commended for their concern and zeal. Many equally sincere persons, however, believe that if these groups succeed in forcing the U.S. to accede to their demands for a nuclear freeze, it may turn out that we have been led into a colossal trap. The major argument against the freeze has been that it would lock the Soviets into their current position of superiority, leaving us vulnerable to nuclear blackmail. History supports the fears of those who believe that Soviet intentions are not compatible with peaceful coexistence. In 1977, President Carter was turned down flat when he proposed to President Brezhnev a freeze on the development, production, and deployment of nuclear weapons and a renunciation of the use of force in Europe. In order to show our good faith and to encourage the Soviets to follow our example, we made a whole series of significant unilateral cutbacks in our nuclear strategic forces. As a result of that, have we already walked into a trap? And is it in the process of being snapped shut on us? A Frightening Clue to Soviet Intentions In 1977, President Carter's administration canceled the order for 250 B-1 bombers that the Pentagon felt were urgently needed. 
Only in 1981 was this decision partially reversed by the Reagan administration, which ordered 100 B-1s. In 1978, the Minuteman III ICBM production line was closed, canceling 100 missiles, and that same year the production line was closed for short-range attack missiles. The following year, 400 Hound Dog cruise missiles were deactivated. During President Carter's presidency, there were significant delays and cutbacks in the production and deployment of ground-launched and sea-launched cruise missiles and air-launched missiles. The Trident submarine construction was cut back, and the Trident II missile development was postponed. In the first two years of President Reagan's term of office, 10 Polaris submarines with 160 SLBMs were deactivated and the planned deployment of the MX was cut in half. Further, 54 Titan II missile launchers are scheduled for deactivation in 1983. What was the response of the Soviets? Taking advantage of our cutbacks and delays during that period, the Soviets gained nuclear superiority through the most massive military buildup in history, which still continues at a frenzied pace. Obviously, they are not after equality, but superiority, and they will apparently not be satisfied with a significant advantage, but only with an overwhelming superiority. As Jimmy Carter's defense secretary, Harold Brown, remarked, quote, We build, they build. We stop, they build, unquote. In 1946, when the U.S. had sole possession of the atomic bomb, through its U.N. ambassador, Bernard Baruch, it offered to share its nuclear secrets with the world for peaceful development of atomic power. This technology was to have been placed under the control of an international commission which would supervise the destruction of all nuclear weapons then in existence and prevent their further production. This generous plan was vetoed at the United Nations by the Soviet Union, which was already deeply involved in stealing U.S. atomic secrets through its spy network with the help of the well-intentioned Ethel and Julius Rosenberg and others, who apparently sincerely felt they were working for peace. If the Kremlin is really in favor of nuclear disarmament, 1946 would have been the time to vote for it. In fact, Soviet leaders have never swerved from the communist goal of world domination, and it is clear that this has been the motivation behind their unrelenting drive to achieve overwhelming nuclear superiority. A Deadlier Trap? A hard-headed, realistic look at the world scene gives little cause for optimism. However, massive new forces are gathering momentum for positive change, spurred on by the desperation and lateness of the hour. U.S.-Soviet arms talks are in progress once again. After the recent death of Brezhnev, the swift descent to power of former KGB chief Yuri V. Andropov, acquiring the position of general secretary of the Communist Party almost immediately, surprised Western observers and could be a good sign. The remaining leaders in the Kremlin are elderly and not in the best of health. Change is coming soon. Many observers fear that a new and younger Kremlin under Andropov's leadership will take an even harder line. However, this has not been the case with the new leaders in China, where many unexpected and encouraging developments are in progress. The same could happen in the USSR, confounding the experts. Wall Street has been giving the world a most remarkable demonstration of experts being caught totally off guard by the impossible happening suddenly. Certainly, the stock market isn't acting as though famine, depression, death of the dollar, and World War III are on the horizon. It seems instead to be saying that peace and prosperity lie just ahead. Whether the market is accurately forecasting the future, as it often does, remains to be seen. At the very least, however, we have a vivid demonstration of how quickly gloom and doom can turn to euphoria. That remarkable prophet, H.G. Wells, predicted a coming period of peace and prosperity with these intriguing words, quote, a time will come when men will sit with history or with some old newspaper before them and ask incredulously, was there ever such a world? Unquote. The coming peace and prosperity may carry some unpleasant surprises. Opponents of the nuclear freeze argue that it would turn into a trap, eventually handing the Soviets control of the world. Strange as it may seem, the coming new age of peace and prosperity could prove to be an even deadlier trap. According to the Bible, 
there is something far worse than communist control of the world, the Antichrist, not the Kremlin, will be taking over planet Earth. Make no mistake about it, the Bible declares clearly that a new one-world government is coming. Appearing at first to be the beautiful solution to everything, it will eventually be unmasked as Satan's kingdom, bringing utter destruction. But by then it will be too late to turn back. Will the New Age movement be able to prevent this from happening? Or is the New Age movement in fact part of a cosmic conspiracy to install the Antichrist? Is that what the Aquarian conspiracy really is? We will confront these questions later. How will the trap be sprung? One of the major difficulties that must be faced by New Agers and by our own contrary scenario is the seemingly immovable set of national, ethnic, social, political, and religious barriers of today's world that stand in the way of the new one-world government. What could possibly unite a world that is now so divided? There are those who believe it will come about through a growing recognition of our common brotherhood as human beings, a realization of our quote-unquote true self that will transcend all else. However, Many Bible scholars believe that World War III may occur first. From the ashes of horrible devastation, the Antichrist will presumably arise to rule a world desperate for the leadership of a genius able to pull everything together out of chaos. If this interpretation of Scripture is correct, then the next event in the prophetic timetable must be the Soviet attack upon Israel precipitating World War III. Our contrary scenario, however, disagrees with this viewpoint. Peace, not war, lies just ahead. A number of important scriptures seem to indicate that events will turn out somewhat as follows. The threatened worldwide financial collapse will metamorphose into booming prosperity. Ecological disaster will cease to be a serious concern. The United States and the Soviet Union will move toward disarmament and cooperation. The threat of war in the Middle East will end. Peace will reign over all the world, seemingly established firmly and permanently. Nearly everyone will be convinced that a new age of unprecedented brotherhood, progress, peace, and prosperity has begun. The Bible indicates, however, that it will be a trap, a satanic counterfeit of the promised millennium, a deceptive prelude to disaster. Just when Earth's inhabitants, and especially the Israelis, are feeling most secure, all hell will break loose. Verses 2 through 4 in the fifth chapter of 1 Thessalonians seem to be saying this, quote, For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying, Peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly, like birth pangs upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you like a thief. Unquote. It is difficult to accept this scenario because World War III seems to be the only catalyst that could reasonably prepare the stage for the Antichrist's ascension to power as world ruler. There is, however, another rather surprising possibility. <laughs> 